welcome to my corner of the internet. I think this is the last part of Casey's journey. Yes. Um, we're going to talk about, we're going to touch real quick on her past real quick, and then we're going to jump into um, where she is now because she is very successful in my eyes. But, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> go for it. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to go into a little bit about my 20s, but in order to give some insight into my perspective around that we're going to delve a little bit into the past so i had mentioned earlier that i'm from miami and my dad's italian and that i grew up a lot with my grandmother because of some things that were happening with child molestation in the catholic church and my dad was actually a heroin addict and i believe he still is to this day he functionally does drugs i'm not sure exactly which ones because he's not really in my life but he's very high functioning when i did see him he's got his hair his teeth he looks great he just doesn't seem to keep up with me and then tells people that he does, which is interesting when my family asks me about it. But the thing I'm grateful for to him is that he did introduce me to my two cousins and my uncle who's since passed now, which is his only brother, and they were the most incredible people, their wives, their children. It's been a blessing to get to know them. And so definitely had some trauma with the dad just not being around and just leaving me spiritually uncovered and not being what a dad should be to a child, especially a daughter, giving her, you know, her identity, really being there to su support and protect her and to threaten any men that come near her. Most importantly, that. Now you have me. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and Mara. And so yes. by the time I had hit my 20s, I had graduated high school and... I went into high school at 17 years old because I'm young for my grade and I start off in high school and I do have an estranged half sister who is the blonde hair blue eyed sister who just hasn't been really the nicest person in our family. She's been pretty dark about some things that happened in our childhood which rightfully so she got distressed and traumatized from it but I had the same circumstances if not worse and we just chose different paths. We're very different people and so while I love her the hatred that she's shown to the family and you know just wishing that folks were not possibly alive and and just her ill will and intent towards our family has caused me not to speak with her any longer even though I love her dearly and I obviously pray that you know at some point her life gets back on track or if that's the life she wants to live that's okay and so I definitely have her there so growing up in Miami I had my father until Hurricane Andrew hit and then about a year after that, my mom had separated from him because she found out that he was a heroin addict and was having to drive him, while she was pregnant with me even, to the methadone clinic after she had found out about this addiction to get him the medicine to be released from these drugs. And then the hurricane happened and my grandmother died, his mom, and his house got damaged, his townhouse. And so my dad kind of went off the deep end. He had stolen thousands of dollars, I think the upward of ten to $20,000 from my mom that she had saved to stay home with me as a mom just while I was really young. And it really broke my mom down. And I remember her telling me that my grandmother, before she died, told her to leave my dad because everything he touched, he killed. And while it was painful for her, after she had seen some things, my mom decided to separate from him. And that's when she was thinking about putting us in the Catholic Church while my grandparents moved up to northern Florida because she wanted to make sure she could keep us there, but my mom was a full-time working mom. And so when everything came out about the Catholic Church, my grandparents said, you know, we can't imagine our grandbabies getting hurt. Let me take them up to North Florida. And my mom did. And she definitely tried to work things out coming up to see us and trying to work up there. It's just, it was a smaller town, and so it was really difficult. So she really wasn't around most of my childhood. And I grew up with my grandma and my grandfather on seven acres of land with her two sisters that also own land next to us. And again, really cool, really peaceful in the country. We dealt with a lot of racism up there, unfortunately. And I obviously missed my mom a lot. And I didn't really remember my dad as much because the only time I think he came to visit me is when he brought me a pack of gum when I was four, which was really kind, but weird. So yeah, he didn't make much effort to come get me or to see me or to visit with me. And so that kind of faded into the background. My half sister had a dad who really doted on me and her both of us, and was pretty supportive, pretty involved at a certain age. I know there was some conflict between him and my mother when we were younger, but he was always really kind to me, and my sister, you know, got nice shoes and some other things that really made her happy. So it, it really helped out. Unfortunately, my grandfather died around the time I was eight, and then my grandmother developed Alzheimer's, which is why we ended up coming into Denver with my aunt and uncle, who I call my mom, because she legally adopted me and got guardianship over me. 
and she was wonderful. She definitely did the best that she could. Obviously, we had some family dynamics that were unhealthy and some things around her marriage that got damaged because of her husband's actions and just, you know, things happen in a marriage. So we're not going to point fingers, but there are definitely some things that happened with the husband that were pretty inappropriate towards children. So moving on high school into graduating high and graduating and moving into college, I definitely had some wounds around men and what had happened to me. And so by the time I got into KU and I was halfway through my school year, I was molested. And so by the time I was 18 years old, I had already been sexually assaulted twice and once was in my home in high school by my uncle. And so it was really painful for me and that definitely caused a lot of further trauma because my dad was a heroin addict who was absent. My uncle came in and while I was uncovered by my natural dad, not uncovered physically, but uncovered in the sense that he wasn't there to protect me, my uncle defiled my body. And years before that, when we first moved in, my half-sister was actually also molested by the same man from a position of trust, which is just terrible because it really shakes up your sense of security and it really is just awful to deal with, especially when they have a daughter that you're extremely close to and it causes a great divide between you because that person carries the burden of their dad doing something horrible to someone they call sister. And so definitely a lot of pain and wounding during that. And this also happened during my senior year when I found I couldn't cheer. So I already had some depression going on. My life was turned upside down. I was trying to figure out which school I was going to go to because all of a sudden I wasn't cheering. I was going to have the scholarships coming in. Where am I going to go? What am I going to do? And so I embarked on this path of trying to find myself my senior year when I got closer to Jenny and they were so supportive and encouraging of me. They're like, hey, you're so talented. You love theater. Like you should go the creative route. Like now you're not cheering. You don't have any limitations. So I came to my parents at the time, aunt and uncle, and I said, hey, I want to go to art school. And even though my sister was in it, they were like, absolutely not. You're not established. You're going to be a starving artist. This is not a good idea. And so unfortunately, they did not support that at the time. And it was really disheartening. So I ended up just coming back home after I was sexually assaulted in college, which did end up going to trial. And it was this really awful ordeal with a guy who happened to be someone who was also religious and said he was a church man and loved God and yet decided to inappropriately assert himself in my body or on my body while I was sleeping and so that was the second time I was sexually assaulted unfortunately and I was only 18 and I was 16 when my uncle assaulted molested me and he's also a man of God so you've got this really crazy wounding from men but also from the place where I place my faith which is my religious beliefs around Jesus Christ and being a Christian and so there was a lot of shakeup in that that really shaped my outlook around men and what I felt comfortable with or uncomfortable with and just really causing some deep psychological damage. So entering into college, by the time I was 18 I had been sexually assaulted twice so that definitely shaped my beliefs around men and it really attacked my sense of security emotionally and psychologically and it definitely caused a lot of trauma. Yeah. And so once the one in college happened I was brought back home and forced to live in a house with the man who had already just assaulted me a year before and then I was told hey you know you you clearly were so fearful of the first one that you re-manifested this which felt like a stab and an open wound and so just really again trying to find myself went through a really crazy struggle of who am I what do I want who really cares about me you know can I survive this life like where am I gonna find my footing and again having some great support and friends around me always being that voice of reason and that voice of encouragement and comfort in times of stress you know they told me hey you don't deserve this you need to get yourself out of this situation and just separate from it it's not healthy for you we love you we want the best for you and whatever it takes let us know we'll help you plan we'll help you research and so that was so encouraging and, and just such a blessing for me at that time and I was working on the side, definitely went through several years of kind of working in a corporate atmosphere where I gained lots of really diverse, really great professional skills that felt like I was dying inside. And felt like I was dying inside. I don't think creative with people... every staple. <laughs> yeah. Dying a little bit more. <laughs> creative people aren't meant to have like a normal nine to five mm -hmm. or like a corporate job. Yes. I don't know how Mara does it, but like I think when you're free spirited like us, mm -hmm. like being micromanaged is a nightmare mm -hmm. it's like the scariest thing for us like, absolutely yeah and I think I found myself in so many jobs where I would come into work and I would just be thinking 
a college student could do this. An intern could do this. Why am I here? This feels crazy. And so I just remember feeling like my creativity was dying with literally every staple. And I remember telling someone, as dramatic as I was, every staple, I'm losing my creativity. <laughs> but okay, that's, how I, that's how I felt. And so I went through the motions because everyone just said, you know, suck it up. You know, if you're an artist, you're going to struggle. You're going to have to wait tables. It's going to be this awful life. And so I bought into the lie. Instead of having people around me that really encouraged me to do what I was good at and to really thrive, I had to struggle and try and side hustle it and try and build myself back up where I had been told all these negative things. And so I went through years of suffering, literally. It wasn't until 2015, which was almost nine years later, that I really decided I'm going to start creating. I am going to full on jump into graphic design and visual design and installation art like this piece where I'm going to really do something that I enjoy and it doesn't have to be my main thing, but it will be someday. And so going through that cycle was really painful in the beginning because again, I got pulled back out of college and I'm here and living with an uncle who stresses me out and I don't want to be around him and you know, he's like really nasty to me, telling me I'm a bitch like my aunt and just really demeaning me and at one point I had mono and he didn't buy food and so I was eating old beans out of, you know, old cans that were expired for years because I had nothing else to eat. And unfortunately that got me into going back to school full time because I started dating a DJ who was someone who did drugs every day that hid it from me. And so getting into that relationship because I was running from my uncle who was someone who wanted to touch children and did. Um, really became a struggle because I got from one really toxic situation into another and while this person the DJ was a really sweet nice guy who was really nice to my friends and he'd have dinners and he was really social so there were so many likable things but then this underlying drug issue that I really hated I knew my dad did drugs growing up and it's always been something I've hated and it's something that I've never touched because I just didn't want to it's been offered to me countless times I'm 32 now and yeah. I've turned on drugs more times than I can count and free drugs at that and so I just had this disdain for drugs and so it literally drove me away from that relationship because it was just toxic and it wasn't the kind of life I wanted to be leading right. and I literally came in one day and he was throwing blood in the toilet and I'm 20 years old at the time and about to turn 21 and I just remember thinking you know this is not the kind of life I'm gonna lead this is not for me I need to get out of here I don't want to have kids with you I don't want them to see this this is terrible and so I removed myself from that situation, and unfortunately the end of that ended up with me calling the police because he threatened to jump off the balcony. He had stated that he was going to lose the only thing that was good in his life, and I was the best thing he'd ever had, and he couldn't lose me, so he was going to jump from our seventh floor apartment. And so, yet again, more man trauma, you know, um, really traumatic, and just having to clear myself from that. So, got away from that, went back home again to the toxic uncle unfortunately and it's all I had to lean back on at the time and again was still going to college was really stressed obviously having to deal with a man that I was scared living in my house or I was living in his house so to speak and it just was very emotionally toxic and I think the biggest part of my stressors around men formed from my uncle who had touched my sister when I was 10 years old and until I was 16 years old I slept with a little paring knife under my bed to the point where I didn't want my family to know that the paring knives were missing and we had like six or seven that were different colors so I would rotate the knives out so that no one would know that I had the knives under my bed and I did that because I was trying to build up courage to stand up to my uncle at the time and fearing that he was going to come hurt me and every time I got in the car I remember just thinking he's going to rape me he's going to hurt me this is going to be terrible like how am I going to survive and just living in that fear every day from when I was 10 until I was 16 and it just really shapes a lifestyle and a yeah. belief of fear and unfortunately when I was 16 it actually did occur and it happened to me and by the grace of God I had enough common sense and strength within me to to lie blatantly lie and say I had to go to Walmart to get out of that bad situation because when someone's drinking and they're hurting you you have to remove yourself because when they keep coming in you know it's gonna get worse and so thankfully I had built up enough courage over six years to get myself out and I wasn't gonna be a victim I saw what my sister went through she never let me say what had happened to her because she was afraid that she would get kicked out, which happened anyway, unfortunately. And so, you know, it, it just was a really different situation. So having to go back into that situation with my uncle was really 
not fun for me. It was very painful, very scary. Um, I was definitely not at ease. And so I was still going to college then as well. I was studying industrial design downtown Denver and I was having to commute. Downtown Denver, going to college is a whole other topic of its own. If you don't get a parking <laughs> spot, you don't go to class. Yeah. So definitely was not my favorite experience. And unfortunately, I ended up removing myself from that as well because it just was not a good situation for me educationally the stress of finding a spot I and mean, when you don't find it you're missing class and then you have a lot of stressors regarding that as well so unfortunately at the time it wasn't a good fit but I enjoyed it it was really fun I found my love of actually making things yeah. building with my own hands which was incredible so I started working downtown when I was going to school in 2009 at a prominent club it was very classy we had bouncers that really vouched for us and really made sure to protect us and everything was going great I unfortunately had this guy who came in who was really obsessive over me and was very weird and when I say obsessive and weird, I mean to the ex, the, just the extreme. When you work in a club and you're a beautiful woman, people are going to come up to you. They're going to hit on you. They're going to ask for your number incessantly. But this guy was off. And I remember having prayed about something. And I woke up the next morning and I went to work. And this man told it to me in the club. And I used to turn down everybody. But this man said something that I prayed about. And I was really big at the time on building community doing work with orphans and foster kids. I really wanted to run dinners where you could inv where I wanted to buy a home or a structure where different people could come in and give foster kids what it felt like. Actually more orphans, excuse me, than foster care because orphans are in a big home where it doesn't feel like family. So I had wanted to create and build a nonprofit and to buy a structure where they would have people that could act as moms and dads yeah. or just brothers and sisters, but just to give them a home-cooked family meal where they felt welcome and like it was a warm family. Yeah. And so I had prayed that in my prayer and was talking about community and this gentleman came in the next day who had kind of had some weird behavior that night and had literally told me exactly what I had prayed about. And so I remember thinking, oh my gosh, Lord, that's amazing that this just happened so fast. Not my type, not attracted to him, but you know, he does all this work with orphans and he's a foster volunteer and he reads all the books that I'm reading and come to find out he was actually a really unhealthy mentally ill man who was involved in my drugging that year to which I actually ended up getting pregnant from and I have a son now and so I'm 21 I've now been assaulted a third time and more trauma so dealing with this aspect has definitely been the biggest challenge and fight of my life I literally couldn't work anymore at that nightclub. I was so paranoid that I was going to get drugged again and that he was going to set something up. And he was upset with me because he had gotten kicked out because he was coming into my workplace drunk, belligerent, and saying horrible things about me and really overly sexualized things and was just a really inappropriate person who definitely had some mental illness going on. And I remember him getting in with my friends that were close to me and finding out what I liked and what I wanted and what I admired and people and he literally mirrored that and started lying and creating this persona that would amplify all the things that I found yeah. to be really beautiful in a person, woman, male, whoever, just, just people, good hearted people, humanitarians. And so he became that. So when I got drugged, he came in and said, hey, I don't care if you've been raped, I'll take care of this child, you know, it, it's no big deal, like I'll love this child like it's my own and had built this whole life around all these lies. So literally the only thing I got correct out of his entire life was his name, his family's name, and that his family owned a company. I didn't know he was married and getting divorced because of his habitual lying to his family's company and his alcohol slash drug use. And he would constantly cover up things and make you feel like you were crazy even though you knew you saw what you just saw kind of a thing. And he came in and just became this thing that, you know, this person that I had always wanted, yeah. just, you know, someone who worked with kids who had nobody. Yeah. And that was something I admired so greatly, someone who would give back to kids who had nothing, orphans. Yeah. That was so close to my heart back then that I just was enamored with that. I was really in love with the idea of caring about someone and having someone who wanted to be in a relationship with me who loved, you for you. loved me for me and would and raise a child that wasn't his yeah. and who would give back to orphans who had nothing and they were spiritual they believed in god they were great people they supposedly paid for all of their nephews summer camps because their sisters overspent on purses and couldn't tell their husbands about it he created so many lies to make everyone else look bad and to make him look great 
you know, he made all these delusions about how much money he made and positions he held, and come to find out he was married. He didn't support his family the way he said he did. He didn't give back to orphans and volunteer his time. Um, he was about to get fired, or had already been fired, from his job of his family company because he had lied and sold $40,000 that summer from them. He had also sexually assaulted some a woman or women and was involved in a prostitution ring where he was on trial for four years to life. Unfortunately, they couldn't find the woman, so he was released of all charges, supposedly. And so I found out after I'm pregnant that this man's very unhealthy, very a very scary person and so I removed him from my life and he again as soon as I wasn't willing and going along with his lies became very hostile manipulative and downright just abusive verbally and emotionally um, calling me back to back drunk eight times you're trash you're a whore and then calling me back later and saying oh I'm so sorry I didn't mean any of it and to the point where he was literally harassing myself and my family whoever he could get a phone number for and it was very scary so I had my son and he came out and I looked at him and I said oh shit and I knew that this child was the result of a rape and a drugging by this man. How he fostered it, how he created it, I'm not sure. And he's never admitted it, and I'm sure I'll never get the story of it. But it terrified me. I went down, tried to file charges, and because it had been so long, the police couldn't really do much. They didn't have the same people that were working there. They couldn't get all the details in place, and they told me without a shadow of a doubt, there's going to be some form of doubt in this case, so we can't continue to finish persecuting it. And I had found out that he had been in the ER once I went to the police because he was having panic attacks because I went to the police about him drugging me. And my whole thought was, well, if you didn't drug me, why are you having anxiety? It didn't make sense, and I didn't know why his own family didn't realize that. But regardless of that, moved past that, had my son, and I was in so much fear from this man intimidating and bullying me that I was afraid to open my blinds in my house because he would threaten to come and steal my son. And he tried to force me to get an abortion when I was actually pregnant with my son um, because he had changed his mind about raising someone else's child but in hindsight obviously we know that he was afraid that he would get outed for actually being part of my drugging and that this child was actually his and so it just was a really traumatic situation dealing with him over the years he would talk to my bosses and tell them that I was a horrible mom and that he was gonna come take my child from me and make up all these lies and then it came to light that he was actually the person that wasn't involved and didn't care and was still drinking, still possibly doing drugs and just lying about everything and creating these fantasy worlds for himself to live in and so I just did the best I could. I went through three back-to-back -back custody battles fighting for my son's life. At one point he violated that term and was given my child, hid my child, gave him to people that he didn't know that was connected to someone he had started dating and hid my son from me for two months and brainwashed my son to the point where my son had disassociation and a lot of really deep trauma to where we were in in-house intensive in-home therapy four days a week for multiple hours a day for a long period of time just to get my son up to a normal level where he could function as a young child and that came actually after me fighting through three custody battles of having to fight to even get the rights to take my son to be seen because he didn't want him getting medical treatment because he would unfortunately be outed by all of the terrible things that he had done to a three-year-old. And so just telling, you know, a three-year-old, hey, your mom hates you, she wants to kill you, you can never see her again. She's, you're never going back. And my child just being devastated to the point where he literally left his brain so that he could cope with the new reality. And we've definitely worked through that as a family my son and I thankfully my son's doing a lot better and he's in fourth grade now and so he is just blossoming into such a beautiful child he's got a great heart I've definitely raised him with the foundation of Christ I've definitely raised him to be a man of integrity and a man who does what he says he's gonna do and just wanting him to really treat others the way he wants to be treated and to become a great citizen of this world to be a good person it doesn't matter how much money you make or what job you have what I've really insulted in my child is kindness, empathy, perseverance, strength, integrity, good character, following through, giving back. It's not all about me and life. And so overall, in my 20s, I definitely struggled a lot. I'm now in my 30s. And my son, I have my full custody back as of four years ago. So we've been through a process of really healing. And again, I started designing in 2015. So it's definitely been a, a place of healing and really transitioning into 
the fullness of who I can be and who I wanted to be and making sure that my son blossoms into this incredible child who has every opportunity and resource that he can have. Mm -hmm. And so I fought hard for that. Oh, I've done jobs that I get. I thought I was, I felt like I was dying in, done jobs I didn't like, jobs where my boss has talked about me or talked about everybody for that matter. <laughs> Um, and just sacrifice because family is what is important and my son was important and he's the most important thing to me and so I gave up friends I gave up you know ever dating and ever <laughs> doing anything for myself like I haven't done anything for myself really until last year because my son growing up and being safe and being provided for was my only priority and I did whatever it took to provide for him and so starting from 2015 on I have been designing and I had my young son and I would show him images of really cute pictures and say hey do you like this one do you like this one and I would design with my son's three-year-old two-year-old input so I started Critter House and I started a case collective design studio in 2015 when I started getting into visual design graphic design and service pattern design and I was currently working a or excuse me back then I was working a corporate job and just kind of delved into the design aspect and would play off of my young son who was two at the time about what images he liked and what he didn't like and it helped me to really cultivate my case collective critters which are my animals that I made for my company and over time I've been able to take that into a full-time venture as of last year in 2019 and it's been such a blessing it's definitely really kicked off and been very successful for me it's allowed me to stay home with my son and to be able to go to his report card ceremonies where he gets presented with his award which I was never able to do back in the day because I was in a corporate job and you don't just get up and me leave during a client meeting so it's been a really great blessing and it's definitely been amazing working with different clients and getting to design for other businesses as well even while I'm doing my own work and I love designing for children because it's so fun it's so whimsical and I guess to just bring a little piece of heaven into every home when I give them a really bright fun whimsical little piece of art or a onesie or an apparel item or even a custom designed decor item for a baby's room or a child I absolutely love it. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be able to work from home, to be able to design full time. It's a dream that I had throughout my entire 20s and even as far as high school, just really knowing where I belong, what I'm really good at, what I love to do, how I can just lose 15 hours in a day designing nonstop because I'm so passionate and in love with what I'm doing. And I think it's great. I have yeah. also had to really cultivate creative people around me because for so long my whole life was my son and my corporate job yeah. and just saving up for my home that I own now. So all of these opportunities and my entire life of really persevering through obstacles and trials and staying the course, never giving up on my art and my creativity, you know, overcoming trauma that's happened to me. It's all led me to a place where I own my own home, bought my first home at 28. I have created my own business when I was in my 20s, and it's now fully supporting me income-wise in my early 30s. And so it's just been such a blessing. I'm very grateful. It's definitely not easy day to day. You don't have that consistent paycheck coming in every single month that's identical, where you know you're reporting to someone else, but you have the passion that comes behind it. And the money is good. It's actually better than I was making at my corporate job, sitting in a desk for nine hours a day and being miserable. So I'm grateful for all of the things I've been through in life. They've not been pleasant. I definitely believe that they've given my soul the opportunity to grow and to develop. And I'm so grateful for all of that. I can't say that I would change things because that's not how life works. And it has made me stronger. It's given me an incredible integrity and it's allowed me to really give back and to have a heart for other people because I know what it's like to struggle. I know what it's like to have little and I know what it's like to have a lot. I know what it's like to be where you want to be and to be so stressed out that you don't think you'll ever get to where you want to be. I know the full spectrum now and so I'm grateful for the journey and I'm just glad that God has honestly covered me this whole time because I don't think I'd be where I am today without God's grace and his mercy because I think I would have lost my mind a long time ago with all the trauma I had with men, with my childhood, with mean girls, with yeah. life in general. We all kind of take a punch in the gut every now and then and we do the best we can. I think that's the biggest takeaway is be kind, be a good person, give back. I just truly believe that we should all try to be welcoming, diverse, yeah. accept, accept, and each accept each other, Love embrace each other. equality, yeah. just treat people like they're humans. It doesn't matter where you come from, who you are, what you do, what color you are, polka dotted, yellow stripes, 
we should all love and support each other because we each bring our own unique beauty to the world and we all have such incredible gifts to share if we would only be encouraged and uplifted and motivated to share them we just need support and love and the right place to blossom yeah. and so I'm grateful for your friendship and I'm grateful for your friendship because Casey has been dealing with a lot of my mental illness the last couple of weeks she's definitely got me through it um, she's probably the most spiritual friend I have so she's always the one I pray for you but yeah I'm very blessed to call you a friend and to call me call you my best friend um, Mara you're, you're still you're still one of us we're each other's rocks but yeah thanks guys for watching this series thank you Casey for sharing your story it's a beautiful story it's a hard story and it's a tough story to hear and to swallow for sure but it's real it's and real. things hard things need to be spoken about and it needs a light should be shone on it shone on it shone mm -hmm. shone shone i'm asian english hard <laughs> anyways <laughs> um anyways guys um i will link Critter House and Case Collective down in the description box. Be sure to go check it out. Um, I will link her Instagram, so you can. I think you can shop through Instagram. Yes. Yeah. We're not the most active on Instagram. We really focus on clients, and we do a lot of design that's also licensed behind the scenes for corporations. So not everything that our design studio has created is on there, but our really fun kids collection is on there, which is our heart. Yeah. And so it's fun. Definitely check it out and. Find someone who's got your back, yeah. who loves you and supports you for you, and do the best you can. It's, it's not perfect, yeah, but it's there's a light at the end of the tunnel, and right. it's what you make it. Yeah, and like that saying is, it's not about the quality or quantity of friends, it's about the quality of friends. Absolutely. And it's really weird to see who's going to end up in your life forever and who's not. But yeah, thanks guys for watching. Don't forget to tap that subscribe button and that notification bell. We upload every Fridays. Bye. Bye.